Our uh, next witness, our penultimate witness, is Professor Turner, who is the Associate Director of the University of Virginia's Center for National Security Law. I promise we did not set this up as a University of Virginia day. Uh, he's a former chair of the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security, a veteran of the Reagan administration, and a former national security advisor to Senator Robert P. Griffin, a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Professor Turner received his BA from Indiana University and a JD and SJD from the University of Virginia. He's the author or editor of more than a dozen books and monographs on national security issues, and we welcome him to the committee. Professor Turner. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm honored to be here. Uh, like most JAG officers I've dealt with, Senator Graham got these issues exactly right from the beginning. Uh, I would like to associate myself with his statement, and I'm tempted just to stop there, because mine's probably not going to be as good as his, but I will continue. Shortly after the story of abusive treatment of detainees first broke, I was going on a short vacation with my 14-year-old son driving down Interstate 64 when my cell phone rang. It was Voice of America wanting a comment on the story of the abusive techniques. And my comment was, it appears that some good people have made some very bad decisions. I've been a very strong critic of the waterboarding and other abusive techniques. I co-authored an article in the Washington Post entitled War Crimes in the White House in uh, July of uh, 07. Uh, I served with, with pride on the uh, drafting committee for the executive order uh, 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 barring uh, torture and inhumane treatment. Indeed, one of my suggestions was torture is not the international standard. Under international law, we are bound by common Article 3 of all four 1949 Geneva Conventions. That standard is that all detainees are entitled to humane treatment. So spending a lot of time deciding whether something is torture or not uh, misses the point that we have a much higher duty in our treatment of detainees. Some of the things that have been, that have been done since then have made me furious to the point of wanting to uh, kick a wall or something. But I've continued to believe that the people who made these tragic decisions were decent, honorable, and able. They were also frightened for their fellow Americans and anxious to do everything within their power to prevent the next 911 attack. Now, some may think that good people can't do bad things. I would remind those people that on February 19, 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt issued Executive Order 9066 that ordered the detention and incarceration of more than 100,000 Americans without probable cause, judicial sanction, or the slightest individualized suspicion of wrongdoing. Most of those detained were U.S. citizens. Many of them had been born in this country and never even visited Japan. Their crime was to have Japanese ancestors. Today, we see this as one of the most outrageous abuses of civil liberties since the end of slavery. And yet it was strongly supported at the time, not only by the president, but by California Attorney General Earl Warren, who later earned a reputation as perhaps the most liberal chief justice of the Supreme Court of the 20th century. Another well-known civil libertarian involved in that case was Justice Hugo Black, who wrote the, uh, the court's opinion, the majority opinion, in the Karamatsu case that upheld the detention as, as legal. How could so many good and able people give their support to such a horrible policy? Indeed, one of the few people to speak out against this was J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI, uh, interestingly. They did this because they were frightened and they desperately wanted to prevent another Pearl Harbor. And I would submit that the OLC lawyers, I've met one of them two or three times at conferences, but I don't know any of them well, but my, my sense is all of them acted from precisely the same motive. They wanted to save the lives of their fellow Americans. The title of this hearing is What Went Wrong? Part of the problem, I believe, is a general ignorance of some of the fundamental details of national security law, not only at OLC, but elsewhere in the government and indeed throughout the law profession. In my prepared testimony, I give several examples where the country has been divided by very basic principles of international law. The Geneva Conventions, the, con the third Geneva Convention, provides that prisoners of war are to be tried by military courts, not civilian courts. But this was not well known, and so people got very unhappy. Uh, how could bright lawyers fail to understand that common Article 3 applies? Again, it sets the standard of humane treatment. I think it's not that hard to understand why. Common Article 3 
applies to armed conflicts, quote, of a non-international character. Well, what the OLC people said was, well, there are at least 75 countries involved in this war uh, in one way or another against al-Qaeda. The authorization for the use of military force approved by Congress in uh, October of uh, 2001 clearly authorized the use of force against foreign nations. Again, the concept of an international war. It's not unreasonable to conclude that this was an international conflict, uh, but without a sovereign state on the other side, the better view, and the view accepted by the Supreme Court in the Hamdan case, is that's not the best interpretation. That is to say, it does, it does apply. Common Article 3 states further that in non-international armed conflicts, uh, it applies to conflicts, quote, in the territory of one of the high contracting parties. Now, you can interpret that to mean that a conflict that involves more than one state is not covered by Common Article 3. Al-Qaeda, it was global in its scope. It attacked us inside the United States, in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Kenya, Tanzania, and so forth. So it was not difficult, I think, for non-experts to look at this language and say this does not apply. Uh, I think they were horribly wrong, but I don't think it was an evil decision. Uh, there seems to be an overwhelming consensus in which I share that waterboarding crosses both the humane treatment and the torture line. Uh, I have a dear colleague who refers to it, who's very outraged at all of this, who refers to it as torture light. And I think that's probably uh, a, a good description. It's not comparable to what was done to our POWs in Vietnam. Uh, it's not comparable to the maiming and the, the branding and, and the dismemberment that's gone on through history, but it is wrong. Uh, it should not have happened, uh, and the, the most important thing is to make sure it does not happen again. Uh, as to what we do now about those who make decisions, uh, the Republicans came to power in 1953. They controlled the White House, both houses of Congress. To the best of my knowledge and recollection, no one demanded a truth commission to go after the ghost of FDR or Hugo Black or uh, Earl Warren. Uh, they understood that good people fearful for the safety of their fellow Americans, trying to stop the next attack, made some very bad decisions. And I think that's what's happened here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Professor Turner. It sounds as if you would agree with the uh, observation of the uh, old French minister, Talleyrand, that the greatest danger in times of crisis comes from the zeal of those who are inexperienced. <laughs>